My name is Andy Mock. My family's from Hong Kong, and I grew up in the U.S. I've been living in Beijing for the last 12 years from right after the 2008 Olympics. What made you come to Beijing in the first place? My first job in venture capital, I worked with someone who was the former bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal here in Beijing. One thing that he said way, way, way back when uh, that really stuck in my mind is that China is not only the world's biggest turnaround, but it's also the world's biggest startup. There were so many new things that people could do, try, experiment. Everything from brand new cities like Shenzhen to uh, new restaurant ideas, craft breweries, and obviously everything in between. So that was very, very exciting to me. And I think the main reason I stayed was that it pretty much lived up to everything that I was hoping to experience, hoping to do. Beijing, as the capital of China, has moved towards the center of the global stage. Over the years, there have been challenges as well. Um, we had a time where the air quality really was uh, horrendous. But we can see today that we only need to look out the window to see blue skies in Beijing today. And I think that's maybe another reason I stayed, was I could also see the effectiveness of the government system here in its ability not just to set incredibly ambitious long-term goals, but to achieve them in a consistent and methodical way. How is life here different from your home country and other countries you have been traveling to? I do get to meet diplomats from all around the world. What many of them have told me is they're stunned at how safe and clean Beijing is, and that you can go anywhere day or night and not worry about your physical safety. I've had instances uh, where I think just because of a little bit of luck that bad things did not happen, where I've been in other parts of the world and it has never happened to me in China. What would you call the biggest changes between the two Olympics? You no, know, in 2008, many people were awestruck um, by the pageantry of the Olympics. There was still the sense that I think was not incorrect. China still had a long way to go. Today, what happens in Beijing probably matters quite a lot around the world. And it's not just affecting China, but everywhere around the world. Entrepreneurs in China are setting the pace, meaning that it's not just entrepreneurs in India and Southeast Asia looking to learn how to build technology products. But even in the United States, and you know, there's a joke uh, that started a couple of years ago, that if you want to know what Amazon is going to do in two or three years, look at what the tech companies in China are doing today. Fourteen years ago, many people in the West, investors in Silicon Valley in particular, would say the opportunity in China is companies that can quickly copy what's going on in the U.S. And that was called, you know, C to C, copy to China. Um, and today it's reversed. The government has been very, very responsive to fixing problems not only for entrepreneurs in China, but, you know, if you go anywhere, you go to a hospital today, you go to other government agencies, customer service is a priority. And I think the last thing that has changed dramatically is the presence and the visibility of the Communist Party of China. Look at where we are, right? <laughs> the party has really become much more visible. I was actually surprised when you said we could come and film here. So could you tell me a bit more about how you got involved in this organization? So we are here in the central business district um, party, I guess, workstation is how we would call it. I got to know some of the uh, government officials at the Chaoyang District in Beijing City, and they asked whether I could act as a consultant to help them understand how they could better support, in particular, foreign entrepreneurs to set up businesses, find customers, hire people, raise money in China. been the so-called 
diplomatic boycott by a handful of countries um, and certain interest groups trying to raise issues that are really unrelated to the Olympics. But what I'm very happy to see is that, uh, many of these athletes from all over the world, including the English-speaking countries, are saying, you know what, I want to tune out this noise from interest groups or the, the Western media that are amplifying it and say, I want to focus on what's important, which is the Olympics. How is it going to be benefiting not just athletes, but also the overall spirits? There are uh, effects that where this cannot be as complete an Olympics as some would like, right? Olympics tend to be, of course, not just occasions where there are many spectators. So, you know, people come to visit a city and there's a great contribution to tourism, you know, hotels, restaurants, all this stuff, which, you know, we won't see at this Olympics. But I think the main thing is that people that want to watch the Olympics will be able to. And that this is, I think, quite a feat. I personally am looking forward to the Winter Olympics. 